We thank you for baptismal waters that pour out your steadfast love for all creation. Thank you for the living water only you can provide. And let God's people say, Amen. When the time comes to repent, to change one's mind, let us not accuse our neighbor, but face the truth within us. And not belittle or shame, but seek grace that we can turn our lives around with God's help.
before I read this uh, from this 13th chapter of Luke. Um, in Jesus' day, the Jews from the region of Galilee, which was about a week's walk north of Jerusalem, would pilgrimage and come down to the temple in Jerusalem to offer animal sacrifices in order to receive forgiveness for their, the violations of Jewish law that they had accumulated. This uh, ritual was for them a holy ritual. It's hard for us to understand sometimes. It's, it's foreign to us. Um, but it is for, was for them a holy moment, uh, like baptism or communion is for us. Uh, it was their time to have a sacred moment with God. And as I read the scripture, it, it refers to two events, uh, neither of whom are actually documented in other sources. Um, there is no historical record of Pilate ordering the killing of these Galileans while they were offering their sacrifices in the temple in Jerusalem. However, there are many instances in the historical record, that is, other people who lived and wrote during the time of Jesus, uh, of firm evidence in the historical record of Pilate ordering atrocities just as violent and just as offensive as uh, the murdering of people while they're in the midst of a sacred uh, or human civilian sort of activity. Amy Jill Levine documents several of these atrocities in her Jewish Guide to the New Testament. Pilate, of course, was a Roman citizen, and his religion was the emperor of Rome. He did whatever he thought he had to do to maintain order in a Roman province. Likewise, there is no historical record of the fall of the Tower of Siloam. Siloam is a suburb east in East Jerusalem. And then finally, a fig tree requires at least two or three years, sometimes four, before it will bear fruit. Listen now for the word of the Lord from the 13th chapter of Luke. At that time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. In other words, Pilate killed Galileans while they were in the midst of their holy moment with God. And Jesus asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you, here's a word here that is uh, loaded for lots of us. I'm going to use the Greek word instead. Unless you metanoia, you will all perish as they did. Or what about those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you, metanoia, you will all perish just as they did. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? But the gardener replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock, our redeemer. Amen. 
Back in the dark ages, 1981, <laughs> Rabbi Harold Kirshner published a New York Times bestseller, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. In his book, Rabbi Kirshner took on the problem of theodicy, or evil and suffering in the world. Rabbi Kushner came to the conclusion that bad things happen to good people because although God is good, God is not omnipotent. Even further back in the Dark Ages, all the way back to the midst of World War II, in 1940, my favorite Swiss Reformed theologian, Karl Barth, published a book in which he claimed that God is the one who loves in freedom. Agreeing with Rabbi Kushner that God is good, Bart maintains God's omnipotence, unlike Rabbi Kushner, and claims that we confuse omnipotence with omni-causality. Caus causal uh. Causal? Uh, causality? Yes, thank you. <laughs> causality. Caus <laughs> Causality. Yeah. Or Bart, God's omnipotence is tempered with God's constancy. God is all powerful, but not everything that happens is God's doing. And no matter what, God's love is with us and for us. Jesus' answer to this problem of theodicy, evil, suffering, was an invitation <coughs> to a metanoia. That's that word I used before instead of the way it's translated, because the word that it's translated into is really one of those words that a lot of people can't understand because it's covered with layers and layers and layers of frankly bad theology. So Jesus says it's not a matter of omnipotence or constancy. It's a matter of metanoia or a big change <coughs> of mind. Jesus affirmed that the cause of the brutal death of the Galileans at the hand of Pilate was not because the Galileans were bad or had sinned or had violated Jewish law. He also affirmed that the killing of 18 in the Siloam Temple, Tower, not Temple, Tower tragedy, these 18 did not die because they were bad or because they had sinned or because they had violated Jewish law. In this passage, Jesus categorically denies the 57 verses in Deuteronomy chapter 28, which promise to heap more than burning coals on your head if you violate the law. 53 verses worth of curses. So if you're ever looking for one, check out Deuteronomy 28. <laughs> Jesus' desire to convince folks of the importance of the big change of mind was not limited to the survivors of brutal acts or random tragedy. Even the ordinary decisions, such as the stewardship of the land, sometimes require a big change of mind, a big metanoia, a new way of seeing, a bit of grace. Taking the role of the gardener in the parable of the fig tree, Jesus offers tenderness, time, and nurturing attention as an alternative to the landowner's frustration and his order to chop down the fig tree. He, the gardener, says, before you try to make room for something more productive, let's try this. 
a little digging, a little manure. In my imagination, the fig tree is only two or three years old anyway, and not quite ready to bear fruit. And perhaps the fig tree is stressed by the dry, sandy soil of the Middle East. Soil that needs nitrogen and moisture. Perhaps the landowner's judgment of the fig tree as bad is similar to those who see tragedy as evidence of fault. And so in this passage, Jesus invites us to see brutal acts of violence, tragic accidents, and things that are not productive in a different light. Not as a result of God's punishment, not as the result of the victim's fault, but because there are bad actors in the world, and we do have laws in the natural world, laws of physics, laws of biology. And yet, when I read about Pilate mixing the blood of the Galileans with the blood of the animals of their ritual sacrifices, when I read about the 18 killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. When I read the news, sometimes my heart just aches with it all. And I'm sure that sometimes your heart aches too. When I read about Pilate killing the Galileans in the midst of their sacred ritual, ordinary people doing the things that ordinary people do, I can't help but think of the theater, the theater that was sheltering hundreds of families in Mariupol where Putin put a bomb. <coughs> where ordinary people were doing what ordinary people do. And when I read of the 18 killed from the Tower of Siloam fell on them, I can't help but think about the condo collapse of June of last year, which killed 98 in Surfside a suburb of Miami. And when I read about the fig tree, I can't help but think of the fig tree my husband lost last February, February of 2001, during the big freeze <coughs> in Austin. The fig tree that did bear fruit luscious fruit, fruit that our daughter Carolyn made into jam. And so to that word that I've been avoiding all this time, that word that I've been translating out of English and back into the original Greek, that word that means the big change of mind, Scrub it down from all of its connotations. What it really means is just to turn your head. In God's direction. When God calls. I start formal puppy training this week. On Wednesday nights, I will gather with other 
pet parents, as we are now called. <clears throat> and it is us who will be in the train. Our dogs will stay at home for this one, and our trainer knows exactly who it is she is training, the humans. For the last couple of weeks, we've been doing online training with exercises that we can do with our dogs at home before we begin with the trainer. One of the games we are playing with our dogs is a game designed to help the dog begin to recognize his or her name. And in this exercise, I am to click and reward the dog the minute the dog's head turns towards me when I call her name. That is repentance. That is metanoia. That is the big change that happens when we shift from whatever it is that is consuming us that is not God's voice. And so that is what Jesus meant when he said to the people who were asking, what about the Galileans? What about the people who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? <clears throat> Jesus said, just turn your head in the direction of God, who is always calling for you, always calling your name, always seeking to nurture you with water, whatever nitrogen or nitrogen-like substance you might need. Just turn in God's direction. Just turn your head toward love.
portion of the Confession of 1967. The reconciling work of Jesus was the supreme crisis in the life of humankind. His cross and resurrection became a personal crisis and present hope for women and men when the gospel was proclaimed and believed. In this experience, the Spirit brings God's forgiveness to all, moves people to respond in faith, repentance, and obedience, and initiates the new life in the cross. as we pray for the world he came to save, saying, Have mercy, O God, hear our prayer. We pray for the church. Let us be an oasis in the desert, a spring of water for all who thirst, an abundant feast for all who hunger. Have mercy, O God, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. By your everlasting covenant, Embrace all the nations of this earth with your steadfast, saving love. Have mercy, O God. Hear our prayer. We pray for this community. Save those who are perishing. Let new life flourish among us and help us to bear good fruit. Have mercy, O God. Hear our prayer. As we we pray for loved ones. Show your great faithfulness to those who are sick or suffering. Strengthen them and make them whole. Have mercy, O oh God. Hear our prayer. As we pour out our lives in service to you, ever seeking your will, ever following your way, all in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, and let God's people say, Amen. And at this time, we will hear from Jenny Pace, uh, head of the relational household. Here. 
And the last part is evangelism and hospitality. And just like Becky said, we need a greeter at that door every Sunday with a big smile on their face, welcoming, welcoming people, and especially visitors. And so we would love for you to sign up so you can do that for us. That's a great thing. Um, we also send postcards to the visitors after they've visited. So this is kind of what the relational household is all about. It's, it's a great thing that you see there's lots of little boxes here. <laughs> so we want you to check lots of little boxes <laughs> so we can put you to work. Thank you. Thank you. Through the grace of God, we have gifts in abundance and pour them out like perfume from a flask. Not for our sakes, but to worship the one who lavishes love on the world.
though we forsake your way. Still you call the thirsty to come to the waters. You invite the poor and the hungry to come and eat. Blessed is your Son, Christ Jesus, who calls us to change our minds, to focus on the love and care we can give and receive so that we might not perish. Like the gardener, Jesus tends to us with loving care, waiting patiently for our lives to bear the fruit of his grace. And patiently he invites us to share that care with others. Remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and make us one with people everywhere, especially those who have been forced to leave their homes. Provide us with spiritual food and drink in the wilderness of our days, as you have done for our brothers and sisters who pass through the sea. Do not test us beyond our strength. But instead, strengthen us for service, through Christ, in Christ, with Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, we praise you, God of glory, now and forever. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray together the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
God sends angels to guard us and to guide us. So live boldly. For Christ welcomes all and makes all things new. And may the grace of Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forevermore.